Hey everybody. Happy Sunday. It's been a hot minute. I took uh, the last episode of Bourbon Talk off. Um, I was inundated with uh, more writing deadlines than I uh, really knew what to do with, I'll be honest with you. I uh, just entered into the um, uh, sixth chapter of the book, which has been good, been learning a lot, been doing a lot, and then uh, been working on a, a larger thing that um, hopefully people will uh, see here pretty soon. Cheers to everyone. It's good to see you all. I missed you a couple weeks ago. Um, I kind of feel like even bi-weekly, this is sort of a, uh, a, a post in the road for me. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a good moment to, to sort of uh, take stock and think about what's happening and what's going on, uh, see some good people, talk about some important things. So uh, I missed it. And I appreciate you all um, coming back to hang out. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. First and foremost, uh, fall. It's, it's, it's autumn, everybody. Uh, I, I saw the, um, or I felt the initial wave of autumn come in that little bit of, um, the breeze that has just like a little bit of bite to it. And immediately I was just like, I now have on flannel and boots and jeans. And I'm ready to go. And, uh, it, it, it was so, so welcome. The problem, cheers, by the way, is that in true southeastern Georgia fashion, we're at least going to have one more wave of 95 degree heat. Just sweating, getting ready to pass out from the heat moments. So that's coming. But uh, I'm enjoying it where I can. Windows up, sitting outside on the porch, uh, needing, needing to put on a little bit of a flannel. Very happy about that situation. Uh, right now. Unfortunately, uh, the problems in this country continue on. Uh, if uh, you've been coming to these for a while, and if uh, if you have, oh yeah, Jacob, hope your sick dog gets better. Absolutely. Cheers. Happy recoveries. Uh, if you've been coming to these very often, um, I think you probably have a decent idea of where this stuff has been going uh, and, and what is coming. Unfortunately, as, as we talk a lot on uh, the Muckrake podcast about the writings on the wall about how this stuff works and where it's all heading. So what we're dealing with right now is probably not surprising. And at least you have a, a better understanding of what's going on than maybe a lot of people do. Uh, but as always, uh, we live in an environment where people want to pretend like this stuff isn't occurring. We're going to talk about that tonight, uh, the problem with our media and political class and what that is and why it happens and maybe even possibilities on what we can do about it. But I will say that it is heartening to see uh, a couple of things happening here and there. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we're starting to get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th. Um, you know, I, I keep saying that I am cautiously, cautiously optimistic on what the commission is going to do. Uh, we'll talk more about that on the Muckrake podcast for Tuesday, um, which right now we're scheduled to have Pete Dominic on there. So we're really excited for that. Uh, so a little bit hopeful about that. Uh, obviously, what's happening with the Republican Party, not just pushing to disenfranchise people and trying to overturn elections, uh, but the outrage is there. If you pay attention to Texas, or if you know anybody in, in, know anybody in Texas, um, you know the the people are pissed off about this shit. Uh, they're seeing the the undermining of elections. They're seeing uh, a woman's right to choose being uh, assaulted on by every single day. And the problem here is that the Republican Party, in order to uh, reach out to its base, in order to make inroads with the base. They just continue making themselves more and more unpopular and scornful. Like there are reactions to this, which, um, you know, the problem here 
is that the Republican Party is more than ready to dismantle the electoral process because they are not really electorally viable any longer. But the people are tired of it. The people are absolutely sickened by it. Um, so in the past couple of weeks, watching the grassroots uh, response to what's been going on in states like Texas and in the red states has been really heartening. And people who are talking about substantive issues, uh, certainly with what's going on uh, within the Democratic Party and Joe Biden's agenda, it's really something to see people grasping what is actually happening with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. Uh, I wrote about this on Substack this week, um, th this idea that they are completely bought and sold by special interest and lobbying interest. And... You know, the, the history of neoliberalism and how the Democratic Party has been captured by those forces for a very, very long time. People know about this stuff. You know, we're, we're starting to abandon this idea of like, oh, do Mansion and Cinema just not get it? Like, why doesn't somebody talk about this thing? And, um, or, you know, try and talk sense to them. And I think people are starting to wake up to the fact that the political agenda of the last few decades has been absolutely anti-democratic and just all about redistributing wealth from the bottom up people are waking up and you know this is what i've been watching over the past few years um you know it, it's it's a situation where donald trump who of course uh, a lot of people treated like he was some sort of an aberration you know many americans at this point are saying you know what that's bullshit we know that that's not the truth we know that there is something really sordid and corrupt at the heart of american politics and society and then it needs to get better so i've been heartened by that there's a lot of really scary stuff and we have to talk about that and there's a lot of um there's a lot of obstacles down the road there's a lot of stuff that unfortunately myself and you are going to have to deal with we are alive currently in a moment of incredible strife and this is going to be a situation i truly and honestly believe this where we are eventually going to beat back the forces of the republican party neoliberalism and the corporate right i think we're going to win that battle because i i, I think we have to but on top of that like we are going to watch some stuff go down we are going to deal with some real tumult and we already have but there's a lot of stuff coming down the way and first and foremost we have to educate ourselves but we also have to steal ourselves like in order for this thing to get better things are going to get very rough things are going to get very very rough and the republican party and and you know if you've watched any of these you know this we've talked about it over and over they're not just simply going to go all right you beat us congratulations, you've beaten us in the elections, we have no electoral viability anymore, we give up, we'll do something better. That's just simply not who they are. So they're not going to give up. The white nationalists, white supremacists, they're not going to give up. Uh, these anti-democratic forces who are systematically dismantling our elections and representative government, they're not going to give up. We have a lot to go through yet, but I have to tell you, I, I am... I'm consistently optimistic and hopeful, and I, I, I'm more so than I have ever been. I, I truly think that we're going to beat these people and that we're going to find something better and realer and more human. Um, but man, there's going to be a lot of fighting in between. And on that note, I'll go with the first question. This is from Tommy, uh, who says, I was listening to the last weekender about white replacement theory. And I'm just blown away that this is happening all over again. Can you talk about the eugenic stuff and fascism? Because it feels like we're speeding down that road. Now, in, in part, this is something uh, that I wrote about in American Rule. Uh, this is uh, in the um, World War I, pre-World War II chapter. But just to, to get people up to speed, America has been a white supremacist nation since its beginning. Uh, that is how this country started. Uh, it was started, of course, by wealthy uh, white slaveholding men. And the original decision on how to structure this country came down to, are we going to allow 
the bondage of human beings. Are we going to pretend like African Americans and, and Africans who have been kidnapped from their homes and their families? Are we, oh, Pamela, absolutely, they're talking about it in France. Uh, France is going right in a hurry. And Macron is absolutely just wrapping himself up in uh, anti-Muslim, uh, just absolutely terrible, terrible xenophobic rhetoric. Um, which is the problem is that this is growing around the world. It's not just happening in America. America is where it is currently metastasizing in like the most obvious way. America is right now currently at the center of the battle between white supremacy and liberal democracy. So to go ahead and get the, the history out, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, all of a sudden, these alarm bells start going off in America. And you suddenly start having a lot of people. And, and by the way, these were, uh, it was all political spectrums. Uh, you had progressives at the time. You had liberals at the time, you had conservatives, you had the far right, and all of them in different ways and different uh, uh, conflagrations are worried about the possibility that immigrants are going to soon outnumber white Americans or foreigners who are coming in are going to outnumber white Americans and that democracy itself is a vulnerability, that democracy is a, a, a way in which outside forces can come into a state and then dominate the state. And at the heart of all of this is this mystical idea of the state or the nation. And you might have heard this in terms of fascism, in terms of what happened, of course, in Nazi Germany, but this is absolutely baseline ideology of how the state supposedly works. And in this case, it's the idea that, and, and tell me if this sounds familiar, the people of a nation have a particular character, right? Americans are rugged and self-determined and, and they fight and they're independent and they love liberty and, you know, they fight for freedom and equality or whatever bullshit they want to spew. Every country has these mythologies. Every country creates this mythological idea of who their people are. And that way it creates this amalgamation of all the people. You come together and you create the nation. And because the people within the nation are a certain way, it makes the nation a certain way. And, and meanwhile, by the way, the nation state is absolutely a means by which the rich and powerful and wealthy are able to control society, right? They can buy up everything in a state. And on top of that, the state can then supply armies, or intervention forces that can go around the world and make things safe for corporations and the wealthy. Well, anyway, the idea is that liberal democracy, which of course promotes the idea of one vote for every person, the idea is that immediately that's a terrible idea, that everybody should not be voting. That's what conservatives believe. That's what Republicans believe. That's what the right believes, that not everybody should be voting, that there is a natural, natural hierarchy of human beings. And if we could only figure out a way to sort of sift between the two, which of course has its roots in things like Jim Crow and has its things in literacy tests and all this bullshit that they use to exclude people. So at that point, it becomes well, are we going to have everybody vote or are we going to have the best people vote? And of course, by the way, the best people are always determined based on white supremacy and, and all of that. There's another part to this, and this is where white replacement theory comes in, because white replacement theory is a neo-Nazi uh, and, and, and a recall of, of Nazi conceptions of the dangers of democracy. White replacement theory is the idea that not only is democracy and representative government and liberal democracy in totality, not only do they make us vulnerable and allow people to come in and take over a country, but these people push the idea that that vulnerability is exploited by outsiders and internal traders, by the way, liberals, Democrats. That's why they keep saying Democrats are replacing the electorate. Meanwhile, the entire idea that puppet masters are doing this, which in this case, as all cases, always means Jewish puppet masters, that they are exploiting the vulnerabilities of liberal democracy. 
And what we have heard since the beginning of liberal democracy, which a lot of this starts, of course, back in the 18th century, and America is one of the vanguards of liberal democracy. And remember that liberal democracy does not necessarily mean democracy, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't white supremacist or exploitive. It absolutely is. The question is whether or not we can wrest liberal democracy away from liberal democracy. That's always been sort of the question. But they say that the project of liberal democracy, which is what wrested power away from kings and feudal lords and hierarchical hereditary power, they argue that this is a plan by Jewish puppet masters to undermine the states, take away uh, the power of the church and the power of the wealthy. That's what white replacement theory is. It is a literal fascistic conspiracy theory. It is the idea that America is being undermined by forces outside of itself and forces within itself, which is the nature of all fascistic conspiracy theories. It's the nature of white supremacist paranoia. And in this case, what we are actually dealing with is something that we've seen happen here in America. At the turn of the 20th century, everybody in America was worried about the possibility of immigrants coming over and taking over the democratic system. All of a sudden, they started tinkering around with immigration, uh, particularly in the Immigration Reform Act of 1924, which starts making sure that certain people can't come. They start talking about, well, what are we to do about people of color and the poor? And so their immediate decision is, you know what? We have the science. We have the power. Let's start sterilizing people. Let's start practicing eugenics. So that takes place in America. And let me tell you who loved that, along with the conspiracy theory, of course, that the Jews were undermining the state, Nazi Germany. Fascism starts importing elements of American white supremacy. They admire it. They look to it. It's sort of a how-to guide. Where we are at right now, at this current moment, is really, really close to what we saw at the turn of the 20th century, down to corporations and a few robber barons controlling the entire economy and representative government. The question now is where do we go? The question is whether or not the people who believe in these Jewish puppet masters and all these conspiracy theories, are they going to gain control the same way they did in fascist countries around the world, but also were gaining control in America as we inched up to World War II? Because what ends up happening at, at, and when we get to World War II is that America starts looking at all of its racial sort of white supremacist tendencies, and they're like, oh my God, we can't be Nazi Germany. Well, in the meanwhile, they absolutely looked at Nazi Germany and saw a reflection of themselves. So what we're actually dealing with right now is sort of the seed of where this thing is going. And if you listen to Tucker Carlson, and actually a lot of Republicans at this point are starting to talk about this white replacement, th uh, replacement theory. You're starting to see more and more of them sort of echo these ideas. So if there is a plot, and again, we're in the mind of uh, you know right-wing fanatics and lunatics. If there is a plot to destroy America by using immigrants to come over, and take over our democratic process. We have a couple of choices. One, of course, you can shut down immigration, which they've been trying to do and they're incapable of doing. And actually, even an un unwilling amount of them are, you know, a lot of them just don't want to actually do it. So what's the other choice? Well, this is what Tucker is saying out of one side of his mouth as the other side of the mouth is talking about white, or, uh, white replacement theory. The only other thing you can do is take over the democratic process. You can destroy liberal democracy which is what the right and conservatives have wanted to do since the advent of liberal democracy. It's an emergency. And in an emergency, you can take outstanding steps in order to take out the problem. In this case, that means getting rid of elections. It means taking it out of the hands of the people who are trying to destroy America. So we're talking about either ending elections, rigging elections, or possibly, as a lot of them have talked about openly when they don't think that you and I are listening, Caesarism. The idea that some sort of a dictatorial figure, a person of, of incredible talent and charisma, will rise up and take over the reins of government. They do not think that Donald Trump is going to be the guy. They think Donald Trump sort of led the way, that he was sort of a vanguard who started showing people what they could get away with. Not a lot of people believe Donald Trump is going to be the dictator or the Caesar. They think it'll be somebody after him. 
And that's the question of where we're going. DC is Union Territory said, Chuck Todd makes me angry literally every Sunday, and I didn't understand why until you posted a thread about the media being privileged. Has it always been like this, or has something changed? First things first, you do not have to watch Meet the Press. Turn it off. I used to be the kind of guy, and I don't know if anybody else listening to this or watching this ever was, I used to watch Meet the Press every Sunday. And eventually during the age of Trump, it just sort of became disgusting to me and i was like man they're not talking about anything real they're not taking anything seriously like chuck todd is not a serious person and the further that we've gone the more that it has become obvious that this is not something that you need to watch meet the press in its uh current iteration is sup is supposed to be a simulation of Washington DC inner circles. It's what the politicos talk about when the cameras are off, but obviously in front of the cameras. They do not take politics seriously. It's a big game. It's just uh, who's gonna win today, who's gonna lose tomorrow. It's part of the sportsification of politics. Um, and by the way, a lot of a lot of our cable news is like this as well. Like it's it's a big problem. Now, one of the things that has happened is that um, it has become increasingly clear that our media is not nonpartisan, which it never has been. Uh, American media from the beginning, and this is part of what I was posting about today. Um, in order to start a newspaper or a magazine or a cable news network, you have to have incredible amounts of money. If you have incredible amounts of money and power, then you are probably naturally going to lean a certain way politically. So sure, you're not probably going to be a Republican unless you're at Fox News or Breitbart or any of these other places. But, you know, and you'll be politely liberal in terms of you're not going to say things that are like outwardly racist or sexist or homophobic. But you're probably pretty conservative financially. You want the government to stay out of your pocketbook. You want to maintain the status quo because the status quo has treated you pretty well. And then when you get into the media class, if you want, this is an interesting exercise, go and look up the people that you see on the news. And I'm not just talking about anchors. I'm talking about the analyst. I'm talking about the guest. And what you'll notice is that most of them are legacies. They are people whose parents were in media. They were, you know, at the New York Times. They were at the Washington Post. They were on ABC, CBS, NBC. Most of them sort of legacied their way into the media and or they came from wealthy families. Most of them grew up in New York City or Washington, D.C. in this sort of a coastal environment. So they've grown up wealthy. They didn't necessarily have to fight for, you know, sustenance or their lives. So as a result, they don't see the system as being broken. They see the system as working. And maybe it needs to be worked on a little bit, right? Maybe maybe like there needs to be a little bit of reform, and maybe some of them believe that the rich could, you know, stand to pay a little bit more taxes. But naturally, naturally, inherently, instinctually, they want to maintain the status quo. This has been the case since media first began. In America, it was all biased. It was all party newspapers, and all they did was have these partisan squabbles. The idea of the news not being partisan is a relatively new invention, and that idea was more or less to sort of sell themselves in a different way in order to grow their audiences so they didn't just serve their like demographics. But what you see on the news networks, for the most part, is pretty center-left center, center left ideology. They don't want to upturn the apple cart because it served them very well. They have too much to lose. And maybe they even think of themselves as liberals or progressives or left-wing people. But when push comes to shove, they're not very interested in actually changing things. So what we actually deal with in this country, and this is important, and this is one of the things I really wanted to hit tonight. We have been fed a political spectrum that doesn't exist. We're told that the Democratic Party is left-wing. We're told the Republican Party is right-wing. Well, guess what? The Democratic Party at most, and I'm talking about like the, 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 the most left of the party, center-left. Center-left, 
center, occasionally center right. It's a very large umbrella that fulfills a large part of the spectrum. You are not hearing from people who are far left. You're not hearing from people who are socialists. You're sure as shit not hearing from people who are communist. You're not hearing from anybody who isn't within this very narrow spectrum. Meanwhile, the Republican Party is just off the rails to the right. I mean, this is a nascent fascistic movement. And what has happened as they've gone, they've drugged the Democratic Party with them. I talked about this uh, in my Substack article this week, uh, the one on uh, mansion and cinema. In the 1980s and then through the 90s and the 2000s, the Democratic Party embraced Reaganism. They saw it as a, as a winning ideology, and then all of a sudden they were like, eh, we're going to throw in our lot with the free market. This is where the idea of neoliberalism comes from. Neoliberalism was uh, forwarded by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, not the liberals that we're talking about. When people say neoliberalism, they're talking about within the liberal democratic structure, right? We're not talking about a party. We're talking about the idea that free markets should be left alone, that they shouldn't be taxed, that they shouldn't be controlled, and that they are actually the arbiters and the engines of how society should work. And what does this create? A society where people who have the most money and the most power obviously deserve to have the most money and the most power because the market has made that decision. And if you're watching this right now, my guess is that a lot of you in your life have looked at this system. You said, this meritocracy doesn't work. This meritocracy definitely favors white male legacy people people who have inherited a ton of money and wealth and information, and the rest of us have just been screwed. So in this case, what we are actually talking about is whether or not this country can actually find a semblance of balance. In this case, this is a situation where the right has completely taken things over and corporations and the wealthy have completely tailored the government to their own interest. And what has occurred is that the networks and the media and the legacy institutions they're not pushing for things to change very much. And I wrote about this today. They would be fine with Trump if he wasn't so vulgar and disgusting. Their problem with Donald Trump was that he was an embarrassment. The media's problem with Donald Trump was that he didn't behave like an actual president. If the right would belch up some sort of a professional seeming authoritarian or demagogue, they would eat that shit up. Especially right now, if the right could produce a pro-military, pro-American exceptionalist candidate. Someone who could get up there, possibly a veteran, who could get up there and say, you know what, I believe in America and you should too, and blah, 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 blah. The Iraq War and post-9-11 America showed us that that is a winning combination. The question is whether or not the Republican Party goes that direction, which is one of the things that I'm really afraid that they're going to do. And I'll tell you what, and I want you to remember this in case it happens, our media will absolutely eat it up. They will be right behind this thing, especially after years of criticizing Donald Trump and the Republican Party. They would be so happy to show how unbiased they are by supporting a right wing candidate, which, of course, is what also happened with Ronald Reagan. When Ronald Reagan got in, they were very, very desperate to prove to everybody that they really weren't left wing. They weren't really liberals. But I'm telling you right now that if the Republican Party moves towards a pro-nationalistic, pro-military, pro-American exceptionalism push, they, the media will be right there with them because the media is not left wing, which is something that the Republican Party has lied to you about and has made many of you believe the media is not necessarily left-wing or progressive or even liberal. I mean, you could probably define them as liberal for the most part, but it's a lot. Uh, ju no, next up is Peg. Peg, I saw someone recently call what Trump has a cult of personality. Do you think that's right? Obviously, he has, he has a cult, but I'm not sure if I'd lump that in with past ideas of it. That's an interesting question. So... What I would say is that Donald Trump at this point has a sort of a digital age 
um, market cult of personality. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot about whenever someone wears a MAGA hat or a Trump shirt or they put a Trump sticker on their car, they're telling people, I am a certain person, right? Um, you know, in the past, cults of personality have basically been raised up with the belief in a person and their ability to do something. I don't think Trump supporters actually care if he does anything. I don't think that they actually believe that he's going to accomplish any of the goals that he set off. I think that his presidency sort of made that clear. He never had an intention, obviously, to build the wall. He never had an intention to drain the swamp. All he did was lie about what he did. And people were like, yeah, that's great. Totally fine. I think at this point, Donald Trump has created around himself one of the weirdest um postmodern cults that you could imagine, which is a group of people who are so focused on their political, personal, and uh, consumerist identities that they're willing to do whatever. They're willing to literally die. And with Trump, I, I would say there are aspects of a personality cult, the way that he carries himself, the way that the people who support him sort of reflect back what he does. But because Trump has relied on the evangelical right to build so much of this cult, to create it as a, a, in himself a, a messiah of sort, that it also has that gear. But not everybody has that, right? Like some people look at Trump and they see him as sort of like this guy who is their political hero. Others look at him as a, as a divine agent. The really disturbing thing about what Trump has been able to create, whether wittingly or unwittingly, is he has been able to cobble together all of these disparate elements and create this brand new form of a thing, which has allowed him, as a complete and utter grifter, to take advantage of these people. And so what has he done? He's bled his supporters dry of their funds and basically passed one piece of legislation or push one agenda item after another that actually hurts them and kills them. And, you know, that is cultish. But I think there are different components. It's it's almost like one of those, um, you know, it's like a rock or, or like a, a, a precious gem that like it changes based on the angle that you look at it. Except for this is just pure and utter rot. So he has something that um, I don't think most people are very comfortable even starting to wrap their heads around what he's been able to do, because it says something about us. It says something about our religion. It says something about our consumerism. It says something about our culture that I don't think most people are really at all comfortable looking at or, or recognizing. By the way, my cat. My cat's out here just running around. She was asleep on a chair because she likes the autumn, and now she's running around. So I think she's going to try and mess this whole thing up. I would not put it past her. I was teaching via Zoom a while back, and um, it was uh, last semester, and I was talking to a class, and I was sort of you know lecturing or whatever, and she got tangled up in, in the wires of my computer and just absolutely just ripped my laptop off my lap. It was a mess. Absolute mess. Just Jessica. Okay. Says, I would like to know what you think will happen if our hospitals go bankrupt from all of these overwhelming surges. What happens if foreign investors are allowed to buy them? So this is one of these things that we have to consider, which is the system that we currently have where, um, you know, we're, like businesses, corporations, and the wealthy are constantly looking for, uh, again, vulnerabilities. They're looking for places where they can go in and do something or take advantage of a situation because they're always looking for the next thing that will increase profit. Um, I have to tell you that this pandemic has made it very clear that there is an absolute ton of money to be made within healthcare particularly if they continue to keep healthcare as an exclusive benefit of being wealthy. There is absolutely no profit to be had in making healthcare affordable or accessible. And there are a lot of people, and I know this is disgusting, but it's true. There are a lot of people right now who are watching the pandemic and they're watching all these people die in these hospitals be overwhelmed and they don't see the human tragedy of it. 
what they see are opportunities for investment and exploitation. So yeah, there is a possibility that in the wake of all of this tragedy that people outside of this country are going to take over our healthcare systems and our hospitals, uh, but there's just as much opportunity for American corporations and entities to start taking over the system themselves. And I have to, oh, it's it's been broken for forever. You're exactly right, Will. Like, it, it has been broken for so, so long. And we are so many decades behind other industrialized countries, which is one of the reasons why it's so infuriating that Biden's agenda has been stalled, because it isn't even progressive or liberal or left wing. It's a drop in the bucket of the money that we haven't spent. I mean, we are so far behind. And this system is already broken. But I have to tell you that as this situ situation deteriorates, and if we don't make it better, if we don't figure out a way to curb capitalism and start giving people health care, or at least the basic necessities of life, what's going to end up happen happening is that these corporations and these wealthy people are going to continue to find vulnerabilities in the system that they can exploit. And hospitals are going to be part of it. They already are. Healthcare is going to be part of it. It already is. This is why uh, for-profit prisons are what they are. Eventually, we're going to get into utilities. We're going to get into water, obviously. I mean, as the climate catastrophe gets worse and worse, you're going to see privatization take over everything unless we stop it. Because the whole point is that nobody, nobody is going to be able to just make this thing better and nobody's going to be able to stop themselves. There is a natural inclination within capitalism and particularly hypercapitalism in the neoliberal age. They can't stop. They have to continue growing. They have to find new sources of profit. They have to always, always, always grow. And so what are we looking at? We're looking at widespread privatization, denial of care, denial of resources, and an absolute nightmare if we don't stop it. And in order to stop it, we have to start talking about it in the terms that we're talking about it right now, which is not only a developing crisis, but an existing crisis, a human crisis, an avoidable crisis. And that's, that's unfortunately, the way we have to treat it if we're going to stop this thing. The things I see. Uh, in your interview with Frank Schaefer, you discussed revealed truths versus empirical knowledge. How do we fight fascists whose revealed truth comes from a living, breathing, walking orange lie? Debate, compassion, shame, building community, training, education, bourbon. A little bit of all those things. Uh, to go ahead and catch people up um, as to what the difference is between empirical knowledge and revealed knowledge, it's at the heart of everything we're dealing with. Empirical knowledge is, it is currently 68 degrees out, right? You can measure it. Science can show us that it is 68 degrees. Today is Sunday, September 26th. I had to look. Like, those things are pieces of empirical knowledge, things that are decided upon, that you can, you can find proof of. Revealed knowledge is knowledge that is handed down from on high. It's knowledge that God sends you or an angel delivers, that something a prophet can bring back to you, something that you found out about in terms of a conspiracy, but you can't tell anybody where you found it. You can't argue with revealed knowledge, because if you're arguing with that, well, what do you mean you need proof? What about your faith? What about believing that God would deliver a message like this? Revealed knowledge has been used as a, uh, a refuge of, of tyranny. Basically, you tell people, you know what? God wants me to be king. God wants me to be queen. God wants me to be wealthy and powerful. Are you going to argue with that? Because if you do, I mean, you're going to go to hell. That's how that works. We have moved to the point where we're supposed to be living in a society where empirical knowledge is what wins over revealed knowledge, except for fascism just continually takes revealed knowledge and then uses it, right? Oh, believe me, COVID's not real. It's the New World Order doing all of this, and there is a conspiracy that we have to stop. That's theocratic rule, is what it is. You have to do this because God told me you do. That's what it is. The way that we fight back on this is that this idea of revealed knowledge that the right has been using 
it it has a breaking point. And a big part of the breaking point is that people listen to it as long as it's telling them what they think that they want to hear. In the case of Donald Trump and the Republican Party, like their lives haven't gotten better. What the Republican Party offers their voters is a promise that we're going to, you know, we can't make life better for you, but we'll make these people, we'll make their lives much worse. We will punish your enemies and just vote for us and you'll find out how bad we will punish your enemies. That breaks, the fever breaks when you offer them an alternative that could actually make their lives better. The question is, when will somebody rise up and when will a party rise up or when will a movement rise up that will promise to make people's lives better? Because the solutions are there. Now, in terms of personally, this is about building communities. This is about building relationships. This is about talking with people. It's about avoiding just surface level conversation that, that deals with banalities and just cliches and talking points and things that you see on the cable news. You have to start having real conversations with people. We have to build trust and intimacy and solidarity. And once we start doing that, that revealed knowledge, it loses its power. It's superstition. That's all it is. And once you push back against that, all of a sudden you can start talking within the realm of, of material conditions. Todd asks, do we have time to improve people's lives before all of this blows? Hell of a question. That's the $64,000 question right there. I wish I knew the answer to that. I think that we do, but we can't waste any time anymore. I mean, listen to the old clock tick. I mean, we're facing like climate catastrophe on a scale most people have no understanding of. Like, we got to get moving. I think that we can. I think that there is still time to turn the ship around, which is why I still remain cautiously optimistic. But uh, we don't have a whole lot of time. We gotta get moving. Uh, Alex, I don't know how to ask this, but I'll try. You were talking recently about countries and laws as social constructs, and I get that. I believe it's true, but what does that mean moving forward? If all of this is pretend, and it probably is, then how do you make something out of nothing? Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. And, um, you know, I'm gonna say this, and I'm not being flippant here, but this is one of the defining questions of human existence, which is, okay, if this isn't part of a giant plan, if all of this isn't some sort of like natural order, so if politics and human conditions and economics, if those things are just side effects of make-believe, so if there isn't such a thing actually as borders and nation states are completely products of our imagination and that the law simply has power as long as we believe in it and after that there is nothing there. Well, what does that mean for the human living in the world? And that is a vexing question. I mean, that, that is the essence of, of, of uh, philosophy. You know, when we started questioning... Uh, old traditional orders, whether it was, uh, you know, religion, hierarchies of power, the way that society was sort of built, feudalism, I mean, any of those things. When we started questioning them, it was both a terrifying moment, but also a moment of great freedom. So on one hand, it's terrifying, because if we are living in a, you know, quote unquote, uncaring universe, or if there's not someone watching our ever, every move, and if there's not some sort of a paradise waiting on us when our life is over, well, what does that mean? And suddenly, you know, you look up and you're not inside, and, you know, you're not inside of these bounds that are real or concrete. That's really frightening, and I get that. But I also think that if we recognize those things, if we recognize that governments, laws, societies, reality itself, if we understand that those things are social constructs, that they're made up, that they are the things of fiction that we have willed into being, we can choose to be better. And I actually think that that says more about us. If we can move beyond the bounds of these things, then maybe some of the worst parts of our character, maybe some of the worst parts of ourselves will 
shed away like so much dead skin or dead leaves like if we were able to simply be good to one another because we chose to be good we had a decision to make we could go ahead and exploit people and hurt people but if we decide to be good without any sort of a material award or an immaterial promise of a future life in paradise I think then we can start to create a veritable paradise or something close to it, closer than this. Because I have to tell you, the capitalistic order and even liberal democracy, which we've talked about a lot tonight, those things were created with the idea that human beings were wretched and that we were selfish and that we couldn't make the right decision. Capitalism has at its heart the idea that we are so selfish and craven that society has to be structured in order to revolve around our wretchedness and cravenness. That's disgusting. we got to do something better than that. And I think the ability to choose is incredibly important. Exactly, Teresa says, original sin. That's exactly what it is. The idea that we are so disgusting that we have to be pinned in and we have to be managed, which, by the way, is at the heart of almost all political doctrines. The idea that human beings are irrational and dangerous and they need to be within a system of control. If we can do better, if we can choose to do better, and I think that we can, because I know and I, I think that you all probably do, too. I've had moments with other human beings where it's been incredible, like the amount of like beauty and kindness that they're capable of. Just little moments where you get glimpses of what humanity can actually be. I have faith in that. And yes, it's possible that when you start realizing that all this stuff is social constructs, you can fall into like some really ugly nihilism. But if you can make a choice based on your own ethics and your own principles and you can try and be better, I think that's beautiful. I think that's really exciting. Chris C. Thoughts on how we can overcome the Democratic Party's Achilles heel. Believing all humans are rational and all it takes to get them on your side is a West Wing moment. It is this false belief that lets the mansion, cinemas, and McConnells of the world run dims over. Um, you know, one of the things that I think the Democratic Party, and, and this is, um, it's funny that, that Chris C. mentioned the West Wing. And I love the West Wing. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, I watched that when I was younger, and it was, um, I don't know, it was kind of a beautiful show, and I love Sorkin's patter, and I love that sort of relentless optimism. But, you know, the West Wing was created as an alternative to George W. Bush's presidency. And, you know, I think Sorkin and NBC created it sort of as a means of signaling what a presidency could be. But at the heart of the Democratic Party, and, and hear me out here. I, I want you to hear what I'm getting ready to say, and I want you to, to look inside yourself, and I want you to decide for yourself if you think this is true. There is a fatalism at the heart of the Democratic Party. And I think it was born of what I was talking about earlier and what I wrote about on Substack, which was, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, after the 70s had passed, after the Carter presidency, after the anti-war movement, after, you know, Watergate, the Democratic Party, which had been the party of labor unions, people of color, and uh, people who wanted to reform capitalism, and people who wanted more democracy, um, they gave up on that because they believed that they couldn't win elections anymore. This is after George McGovern, by the way. And if you want an instruction in how the Democratic Party became the party they are today, go and check out McGovern, who uh, was the Democratic nominee in 1972 uh, very, very far left, and the Democratic Party just absolutely rejected him. The institutionalists of the Democratic Party said, absolutely not, you're not going to have our support. We'll vote for Richard Nixon and we'll regroup in four years. And since then, the Democratic Party has almost operated as if there's no possibility where they can win elections or they can wield power unless they concede any beliefs that they have or unless they become more right wing or more like the Republican Party. And in a way, 
it's almost like it's enough for them to quote unquote be on the right side of history. You know, maybe they're not going to win the elections. Maybe they're not going to wield power effectively, but they're on the right side of history. And if only history looks back on it, they'll, they'll see that they, they did the right thing and they tried. The Republican Party understands that politics is a struggle for power. The, Democrat, the Democratic Party has not always understood that. And I think in this case, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema have made unbelievable amounts of money and gained unbelievable amounts of power because they have exploited that belief. The idea that maybe the next thing that comes around, maybe the next piece of democratic legislation, maybe the next attempt to reform or invest in society, maybe Manchin or Cinema will be there. And they're not because they're craven because they're bought and sold, because they're neoliberal down to their core. They don't want government to help people. They are in office, Mansion, Cinema, and McConnell, because they are people of the same stripe. They are in office because they don't believe the government should help people. They believe the government should help businesses, that government should help the market, that the last thing that they want anybody to expect is for the government to help them. So... How, how does the how does the Democratic Party move beyond that? Vote for different people. You know, people say to me all the time, they're like, when are the Democrats going to do this? When are the Democrats going to do that? When you vote for other people, when you primary them with people that you know, people you've been around, people that you trust. when If you want the Democratic Party to move left, you got to work for it. You got to work within the Democratic Party. You have to vote for the people who are going to bring the party left, and you have to stop accepting people like Mansion and Cinema. You have to stop accepting it every time that they bring out some sort of center right or right wing candidate in order to try and siphon off Republican votes. If you want the Democratic Party to be different, you got to work for it because they are not who everybody wants them to be. They are again part of that status quo that we talked about earlier. It doesn't mean that there aren't members of the Democratic Party who don't have good intentions or who don't want things to be better, because absolutely there are. There's movement within the Democratic Party that is trying to push it left and are trying to make it into something other than it is. But you got to vote for other people. You got to advocate for change. You got to get involved. And, and, and we have to stop treating this like something that we watch from the sidelines. If you want politics to change, we got to get some skin in the game. We got to stop waiting on these heroes and messiahs and saviors on the on cable news to fix things for us. Nate, what are the best and worst cases for 2022 and 2024? Um, okay, I'll go to each of them. Okay. In 2022, the best case scenario, and this is what the Democratic Party should do, but that, of course, means that it probably won't do it. Um, the best thing that could possibly happen before 2022 is that Joe Biden uses the bully pulpit and he says, hey, you know what? I had an agenda. We passed part of it. But look what Mansion and Cinema did. Uh, we have to reject them. We have to build a larger mandate. I need you out here and here are the steps that are going to happen immediately and, and make make sure that the people who are running for the Democratic ticket in Congress are just signing up left and right. They're like, yes, 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 and yes, I will vote yes on all of these things, which is something that the Republican Party specializes at, which is party discipline. The Democratic Party could say, you know what, we have power, but we need more power. And look at the Republican Party, look how disgusting and anti-democratic they are and how fascistic they are. So give me more power. That's the best case scenario. And in that case, they would gain seats and they would actually be able to govern. The worst case scenario, unfortunately, is that the Republican Party uh, goes after Joe Biden. They continue uh, hammering away at the idea that he's incompetent or that he's being controlled by people. Uh, they gain seats. And then we basically spend the next couple of years with the House of Representatives just <laughs> impeaching him one time after another for, for God knows what, but probably impeaching him at least three or four times because they have to go ahead and they have to beat the record that Trump set. So it would at least be three times, if not four times. I don't think they'll remove him, but it could absolutely throw a wrench in the gears. And that is the worst case scenario. Best case scenario in 2024. Um, 
I don't know. Actually, I'll go ahead and I'll start with 2024 as worst case scenario. Worst case scenario uh, is either Trump gets the nomination and wins and basically dissolves uh, Democratic institutions the moment he steps into office. And we're right back where we were, but also the media just kind of like snaps back and there's not even the hope of beating him or moving forward. Uh, you know, at that point, he basically would announce that he's going to run for a third term and uh, would absolutely destroy things. And on top of that, his win would basically be precipitated on the Republican Party fixing one election after another. That that would be pretty bad. Um, worst case scenario, 1B would be some sort of, again, a pro-nationalistic, pro-American exceptionalism, pro-military sort of professional, disciplined uh, person to take the torch from Trump, that the media is totally behind. Uh, the Republican Party steals the election through all of the processes that they've set in place. And um, we, we go down a path, the path that I've been talking about. Best case scenario, I don't know if Joe Biden's going to run again. I don't know who could possibly be on the Democratic side, but a absolutely sound rejection of Donald Trump, just to the point where even he is like, you know what, I lost that election. I don't know what to do about it. Uh, that would be something. That would be something at this point. And hopefully, again, you would have some sort of an administration or some sort of a mandate where things could could happen. Yeah, I don't think it, I mean, maybe Harris would be the nominee, but I haven't seen anything from Harris's electoral history that tells me that she could either be the nominee or win an election. Um, she's actually, weirdly enough, uh, Kamala Harris has sort of been put out in front of the Biden administration. It's just taken so much flack, which is something that vice presidents do. But as of right now, I haven't seen anything from Harris that shows me that she would either be um, a nominee or a, a successful candidate. And that could be proven wrong. I mean, she's very popular around the people that she's popular with, but nothing in her run for president showed me that that was going to happen. Groggy Bones, what are your thoughts about finding a way to loosen the power grip of the wealthy and the powerful have over the media with the end goal of our media serving the public rather than the wealthy and those in power? Cheers to many more autumnal back porch political talks. Absolutely. Cheers to that. So one of the things that we have to do, and I, I have to say, and, and maybe this is from my own perspective, but as a member of independent media, what I do at the Muckrake podcast, what I do uh, on, on my sub stack, and what I do here, the support that you give me I think plays a role in loosening the grip of media uh, on, on behalf of the wealthy and the powerful. And I'm not alone, obviously. There are plenty of us who do this. I mean, you know, as somebody like Sarah Kinzier, who used to be a regular guest on TV and now, you know, isn't on there, like it's, it's because she's speaking truth to power, like so many people. Support independent media, find your information elsewhere. And I can tell you right now, that these legacy institutions that still have a name value, that still have a brand value, um, the print and magazines and websites, they're not doing that great. Uh, their numbers have gone down as people, uh, you know, have lost trust in them. Because one of the things that they've done, and I think that you probably have been aware of this, is that in order to increase profits and clicks and ad revenue, they have run some really disgusting uh, stories and articles because they know that you'll share them even if you don't agree with them, right? It's the shock factor. It's people who agree with them and people who disagree with them. Both of them will uh, share them. But they've lost trust. And on top of that, they've cozied up to these people and they refuse to call these things what they are. They refuse to actually talk about the crisis in the actual terms in which it exists. Support independent media. That's, that's, that's the one thing that you can do for sure. And stop sharing things that are obviously created in order to upset you and spur you to share them on social media because all that does is it just creates impressions, clicks, and traffic. So we have to be smarter in how we use our media and social media, but we can also start looking for people who are talking about things in a much more complicated, mature manner. I'm trying. I, I, I hope... 
I'm beneficial. I hope that I help. I hope that the information that I give you can sort of start to make things make sense. There are a lot of people like me who are really, really interested in trying to get to the bottom of these things and talk about what's actually occurring. So that, that, that's one way that I think that you can make a difference. We're getting up on one hour here, so we're going we're gonna to finish this thing. Well, we're going to finish this drink. I still got questions to go over. So good to see everybody. It was a lot of good time. I missed it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Cheers. Thank you for being here. But yeah, we, we have to realize that because neoliberalism has set up so much of a consumerist society, and actually if you go back in the history of neoliberalism, a lot of people, a lot of these big major voices believed that as the economy was centered in, um, in, in, uh, in the world and, and that government and politics were focused on the market, then what would happen would be that instead of worrying about voting, people would vote with their wallets, with how they spent their money, how they spent their attention. And so what they've actually done, no, it doesn't bother when bother me when people meme me. Uh, it bothers me when people take me out of context and they don't actually know what I believe or what I think. That bothers me. The memes, memes are fine. Memes are absolutely fine. It's funny. Sometimes I, or back in the past, it's been a couple of years now, I was sitting in a, um, I was sitting in a uh, airport bar and uh, like I just heard somebody uh, scream out out of nowhere. They just uh, uh, screamed out. He just tweeted it out, which I got a big kick out of. Um <laughs> the the Jared memes are out there. I'll just say that. The Jared memes are out there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think because they've created, um, I think that they created a situation where you vote with your dollars and, and basically you control the market. They kept hoping that um, you wouldn't realize that you control the market that you would just sort of subconsciously do it, which is how the internet works, by the way. Like the entire time that you're on the internet, all they're doing is collecting your metadata and it's giving them an idea of who you are and what you'll buy. So you are constantly, constantly uh, churning um, the, this system and, and, and serving as sort of, you know, the, the power behind it. And in this situation, if you stop paying attention to this stuff, you stop sharing these bullshit stories, you stop spending so much time like going through mainstream media's bullshit and you just reject it, it gets better. And if you start supporting independent voices and independent media, they get stronger. I mean, I have to tell you at the Muckrake and at Substack, the stuff that I've been doing, the books that I write, like, the more that people support that, the more of a platform that I've had. Because even though what I talk about isn't very capitalistic friendly or it's not very corporate friendly, if I'm selling books, if I'm getting clicks, if I'm getting support, then they have to go ahead and bring me on. And that gets you know, voices on TV, it gets voices in print, it gets people, it gets the sound out because you can actually control that system. It's one of the things that we actually have a little bit of control over. Janelle, do you think the Biden administration's refusal to hold past administration accountable has something to do with his declining approval ratings? Thanks. I think Biden's approval ratings as of this moment are a consequence of COVID which uh, he, he doesn't have much control over uh, considering what's going on uh, with the anti-vaxxers. I think it's in part because of COVID, but also because of how the media has covered him. Um, you know, starting with Afghanistan, and, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the media was so disappointed that he pulled out of Afghanistan because they need that forever war. They don't want to be embarrassed. They need the empire to continue. So I think all those things have played a role. 
I think on the left, there is a real frustration that the Biden administration has not gone after Trump. And this is one of the reasons why um, I warned everybody before Biden took the oath of office. Presidents don't prosecute former presidents because it could possibly mean that they would be prosecuted later on. I do not expect Biden to go after Trump or prosecute him or the Department of Justice to do much of anything. Um, it'd be wonderful if it happened, but I don't see it happening. But yeah, I, I, I think those are the things that are holding back his, uh, his, his approvals. Teresa, I was reading your old reports for, oh, and by the way, the fact that, you know, Mansion and Cinema um, obviously have, have pulled a drag on this and the agenda has stalled for the moment. That's a problem. Yep. Death penalty or helping with student loan. I don't think that those things helped either, which I don't I don't I don't think that the government is ever going to forgive student loans because it makes sure that uh, all of us keep working in places where maybe we don't want to work. It keeps us uh, at the press, so to speak. Teresa, I was reading your old reports from Trump rallies in 2016. They are pretty chilling, but also pretty much predicted where we're at right now. Is it frustrating having written about this and ended up here with people still living in denial? Yep. It's very frustrating. I, um, you know, I was sneaking into these Trump rallies in 2016. And um, what I watched there was really disturbing. It became very obvious very quickly that there was a growing fascistic movement in this country that uh, had a bunch of different facets to it that people just were refusing to see. Um, I've been screaming about this for five years now. Five years. And that's hard. <laughs> I, I, I'm tired. I wish like hell. I wish like hell that uh, the people who refuse to see it would understand it. But like I was talking about with the media, they have every reason not to believe it. They have every... Oh, my cat's up. Cat jumped up on the table. <laughs> Hi, Dix. How are you doing, hon? Um, you know, I I saw this happening. Oh, you're a mess. Oh, you're all in wires, aren't you, hon? Okay. All right. All right. Um, you know, as I talked about with the media, um, they have every reason not to believe this stuff. They have every reason not to uh, believe that there's an actual crisis. Because to actually believe that there is a crisis means that something has to change. It also means if there's such a thing as white supremacy. And uh, yeah, it was really scary going to the Trump rallies. Um, you know, in the very, very beginning, I was afraid of getting caught. But then it was something different, which was as I started writing about this stuff and as I started gaining like a national platform, people started recognizing me. And then that changed. Um, you know, it was going into rallies, getting recognized, and that was one problem. But then it was like people showing up at my house. It was people threatening me, stalking me. Uh, those types of things were, that was pretty scary. That was a rough little go. Oh, she just bit me. She is a fun little cat. Um, yeah, so it, it's been frustrating. <laughs> here's here's this beautiful cat, this this wonderful, wonderful cat. She is She is a piece of work. Uh, so yeah, it was hard and it is tiring, but I don't know what else to do. I can't stop in good conscience. I mean, I, I watched this thing happen. Uh, I was on the ground floor and it's populated and powered by people that I know and love and I care about. It's making their lives worse. They've now died of uh, COVID. Uh, they've been radicalized through conspiracy theories. I can't stop, not in good conscience. And on top of that, like, as this whole thing has gone on, I have needed to educate myself as to what's going on. And as I've educated myself, um, all of a sudden now, I have more of a responsibility because I have more of an understanding of how we've arrived at this point. And I didn't know about it before this whole thing started. And now I'm having to educate myself. And as an educator and an activist, I have to go ahead and spread that knowledge. So it's tiring. Uh, it's hard, but I'm trying. Yeah. Thanks for your support. I appreciate it. Sarah Woods, thoughts on Robert Kagan's uh, Washington Post op-ed. 
Uh, so Robert Kagan, who is not right on a whole lot of things, but is occasionally right, uh, he wrote an article for the Washington Post in which he said we are living in a constitutional crisis, and he broke down the continuing crisis with Trump. He was right. He was 100% right. And I am... Um, <sighs> it's nice to start seeing some people call this what it is, which is always a relief. It always uh, feels good to recognize that there are people who are coming around on this thing. And listen, I, I want to be very clear, based on the, the answer I just gave and the conversation we're having right now, it's not cool to run around screaming about fascism and how there's a crisis going on. It's much cooler to just pretend like none of it's real and there's no reason to worry about it. Um, I understand. That's one of the reasons, you know, why I, I, I get a lot of criticism is it's the idea that I've been hysterical or I've been overreacting or whatever. But I'll be honest, I'm just trying. I'm, I'm just trying to explain what's actually going on. And it's a really frightening moment. And it's hard. It's really, really, truly hard. But every time somebody sort of recognizes what's actually going on, and I'm talking about like establishment people, it, um, it feels good. It feels good. Like somebody is finally starting to understand this thing, but we need more people to understand before it's too late. Uh, Ross, can and will the Biden administration do anything about Texas and Florida? There has to be some way that Biden can bring DeSantis and Abbott to heal, right? So the problem with California and Texas is that we currently have a crisis in, um, we, we currently have a crisis between the federal system and the state system. This is one of those situations where uh, in the past, <laughs> the federal government would have just been like, no, you're going to have mandates. That's it. But Donald Trump ceded so much ground to the states because he didn't want responsibility for dealing with the virus. Because if he took responsibility, he could lose and something could be blamed on him. So in this case, Florida and Texas. Yeah. So in this case, so much power has been handed over to the states, which are the only places where Republicans have any control anymore, that the federal government is terrified to stand in and make them do anything. This is a constant moving balance between the states. I wrote about this not too long ago. Um, you know, it was like John F. Kennedy whenever uh, desegregation was taking place and the states were like, we're not going to let this happen. It's like, well, guess what? Federal troops are going to be there and it's going to happen. And um, this is a situation where Biden needs to step in and the federal government needs to take a little bit of authority for itself and fight back against the states. So the, the pendulum needs to swing back from what Donald Trump made possible and it needs to um, reassert some of its authority because in these cases it, it has to happen. But Trump, Trump made this happen. Uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasonings. I've noticed a trend in TV recently, shows where purpose is to provide comfort. Curious as to your thoughts on TV shows like Ted Lasso, New Amsterdam, and Schitt's Creek that seem to sell good positivity to people as we navigate what feels like a hopeless negative void. This has always been the case, of course, with uh, TV. Uh, there has always been, um, you know, a lot of escapist entertainment. Uh, I think Ted Lasso is an interesting case. Um, it's the it's actually the only one of these shows that I've watched or watched. And it, it felt like it was definitely sort of a feel-good show, and it's taken a turn where it's starting to deal with reality and trauma, which has been nice. But I will also say that a lot of our entertainments are about forgetting that there is a crisis. A lot of our entertainments are geared towards making people passive observers of life. Um, you know, superhero movies are like this. Uh, there's a reason why the Avengers are the, uh, you know, biggest franchise uh, and, and the biggest piece of entertainment that we have. It's because we still want to believe that our systems are in control and things can happen. Uh, you know, that all these powers have our back when we're asleep and we don't really have to worry about things. You know, America really, really, really wants... Americans to feel like they're just watching these things happen. They're not worried about it. Passive consumers, exactly. Go out and buy and, you know, vote every four years, and that's about it. Uh, America asked, one of your bi I'm one of your biggest fans. Thank you, America. This cat is so mad. She's such a grumpy little cat. You're a good one, though. 
America, one of your biggest fans here. And with a silly question, I'm afraid, I'm slated to watch the Hamilton musical this fall live. I don't know much about it, except that it's based on historical events. What's your take on it? Is it accurate, educational, interesting, yay or nay? Um, okay, so first and foremost, go have a good time. If you're vaccinated, if it's safe, go have a good time. Like, go see a musical. Um, the problem is when people take things like Hamilton to be representations of history. And... In the case of Hamilton, um, this was a, a, a weird little phenomenon that took place. Okay, huh? this was a weird phenomenon that took place uh, during the Obama years, in which people started reckoning with the idea of what America was, and the idea that maybe an America that could elect Barack Obama was better than maybe we gave it, you know, credit for. And so there was the opportunity for maybe a sort of a new patriotism. The problem is that Alexander Hamilton was an absolute disgusting scoundrel who caused a lot of our economic troubles and more or less underneath a, an assumed name in the Federalist Papers argued that slavery was fine because we could go beyond a civil war and compete economically. Um, not a great person, not a great person at all. So the difference is, again, my advice, Go see it and enjoy it. I've heard it's incredibly entertaining and rousing, but do not take it to be uh, orthodox history. It's it's not real. It's a it's a popular examination of American patriotism from a certain moment, the Obama years. And I assume now, um, I assume now post Trump, it probably feels different. It probably feels like it's coming from a different lens. But that's definitely the era and the ideology that it was born from. So go see it. Have a good time. Congratulations on getting tickets. But, you know, don't confuse it with actual history. Alexander Hamilton, really shitty, shitty person. Alan, <clears throat> do you have a favorite bourbon? Do you have a daily sipper? Uh, I have a lot of favorite bourbons. Right now, I'm really enjoying um, this bourbon called Bell Mead. Uh, I also really like Bullet Tenure. I like it quite a bit. Daily Sipper, uh, something like a Buffalo Trace. I like Buffalo uh, Trace quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Finally. Oh, all we are saying, please remind everyone that the Women's March is next, uh, next weekend, October 2nd. Thank you, Jared. Women's March. Next weekend, October 2nd. Um, again, before we finish up here, oh, Elijah Craig. I like Elijah Craig too. I like Knob Creek. Those are both good ones. Yeah. I've started getting into bourbon more and more and they each have something going for them, but Elijah Craig is really, really good. Uh, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, you know, I was talking a lot about, uh, not just how weird and scary all these years have been, but also how much, um, your support means to me. And it truly does. Uh, I don't, I don't say that flippantly. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard doing this work and keeping a constant eye on this thing. Oh, the California recall. Um, I, I, I thought that, uh, Newsom was probably going to maintain. I also think it, it, it was really telling that like he doubled down on, uh, vaccinations and also mask mandates and the democratic party should listen to it and they, they should, uh, find their spine on this thing and do the right thing. But yeah, I really appreciate you. And uh, I'm very, very grateful for you. Uh, this week on the Muckrake Podcast, like I said, right now we have um, we have uh, Pete Dominic scheduled uh, to come on and talk about uh, recent events. We'll have the Weekender, which comes on on Friday. Uh, if you want access to that, that's over at patreon.com slash muckrake podcast. Uh, dispatches from a collapsing state, which is over on uh, Substack. That's jaredyatesexton.substack.com. If you want to support my work, go over there and subscribe or get a copy of American Rule, which is now on paperback with a brand new chapter on uh, January 6th. Trump trying to steal the election and the pandemic. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, the absolute world to me. I missed you a couple of weeks ago. We'll be back in a couple of weeks to do this again. Do not want to miss this again. It is so life-giving and so wonderful. I appreciate you so much. Godspeed. Take care.